Hey everybody, in today's episode, I'm gonna be doing a rather comprehensive look at the current situation with Russia, Ukraine, and NATO. And so we're gonna be taking a look at some of the historical dynamics behind the situation. And we're also gonna look at the basic geopolitical factors that I think are crucial to understand and consider as a backdrop to interpreting this current situation. I'm also going to attempt to tie this current geopolitical situation in with the larger issues having to do with the Great Reset and the global lockdowns and the pandemic policies that we've seen rolled out over the past two years. And overall, I'm looking at this current situation as being a major indicator of the next phase of this global transition, this global death rebirth process that is happening. Now, before I start going into the geopolitics and the history, I want to just reinforce the fact that on this channel and in my written work, I emphasize a perspective on philosophy that is highly informed by esotericism or esoteric philosophy. And most commonly in the West, we are familiar with the main ideas of this branch of psychology th through the legacy of Plato. So Plato is an ambassador of esoteric philosophy. And if we'll remember, Plato taught a worldview that was grounded in the idea that the world of a of physical form, of objective reality, is underpinned by archetypes. So in a sense, we can think of it as the world of physical form is a creation that's taking place within a universal mind. And the key structures of the universal mind are called archetypes. And so the motion of these archetypes really indicates the motion of the pattern of creation that is held within the universal mind. And in my depth psychology series, I did a lot of work overviewing Stanislav Gross' concept of the cosmic game. So we can think of the, the universe as a creation of a divine consciousness or a cosmic consciousness. And this consciousness works through the divine mind in order to ensoul and enliven creation. So creation is a product of the universal mind, which is acting on behalf of this divine consciousness. So I'm saying all that to say that that's the ultimate perspective that all of my analysis is grounded on, is that there's a meaning and purpose behind life, and there's also a pattern underlying existence. And so nothing can depart from that pattern. We can fall out of harmony with the pattern, in which case we have the type of civilization that we have today, which is a dying civilization, a civilization in constant crisis, because we have a civilization that is out of line with the laws of the divine pattern. And so the challenge is to restore a pattern of civilization that is in tune with and in line with the archetypes, the divine plan. Another factor is that this motion of the archetypes is indicated in the philosophy of astrology by the motion of the sun back through the zodiac in a cycle that's called the procession of the equinoxes. This procession is one that moves through various ages so each age is 2,160 years, and we are currently in the Piscean age. So that's like the master cycle that determines the archetypes that are being manifested in our current stage of, hu of human existence. And then within the context of that great year, that great uh, procession cycle, there is a constant motion of the planets. And so think of the motion of the sun in relation to the zodiac in this grand procession as being the motion of consciousness and the movement of the planets as being the motion of the mind that is structuring consciousness as consciousness moves from its absolute state, from its divine state into creation, to enliven creation. So I say all of that to just emphasize the idea that we're not living in a random universe and in a way, we are predestined to reach certain ends. So when we look at geopolitics and we look at international struggles, we should understand that there is a pattern underneath this that is driving events from a place to a place. But I just want to emphasize that the 
the dynamics that are happening here are ones that are underlied by a greater uh, cosmic motion. And so anyway, I just want to point out and reemphasize the idea that uh, the ultimate types of analysis I do on this channel are ones that factor in this concept that we can recognize from Platonic philosophy. Uh, but in today's video, I want to look at the sociology and the geopolitics and the history and the things that help us create a narrative for ourselves about what's happening. Now, for this presentation, I have done quite a bit of research. I have aggregated material from a number of different uh, news articles and reports on this topic. A lot of this is influenced by my, one of my favorite geopolitical analysts, a guy named F. William Ingdahl. And I've complimented Ingdahl's writings on the kind of history of U.S. and Russia relations um, and the larger geopolitical concepts and strategies that inform that relationship. Uh, I've complimented that with research from a number of different news articles that are bearing more on this contemporary conflict. So before going into the details about this current situation, I want to set the stage a little bit and talk about the basic design components of how I see human society functioning, both psychologically and sociologically. So psychologically, we have the earth populated by 7 billion plus individual human organisms. And each of those human beings has a perspective, an individual perspective on life. So each possesses their own experience of self-consciousness. But these perspectives, these 7 billion perspectives are organized into social units and civilization patterns. And people within a common social unit or civilization group adopt a shared perspective in which certain opinions and perspectives and just way of the way of viewing the world are shared in common and the idea that there's a shared psychological space that exists within a society a collective sphere of psychology um, and in depth psychology this is referenced under the concept of the collective unconscious but in sociology, it's referenced under the concept of institutions. So institutions are these shared social psychological structures. And there are certain basic design elements of this institutional, the existence of institutions that's shared in common across the species. But different civilizations uh, become different. They look different. It, the experience of living in those civilizations differs from one to another because the particular design elements the characteristics of this institutional system uh, is different from one civilization to another. And that's true across time. It's also true across space. So civilizations will differ in time and space based on how they are expressing the design of, their, of this institutional pattern. So the institution is like a top-down influencing force on how individuals within a society experience life and how and how they organize their behaviors and attitudes. So if we look at the most recent era of human civilization, we see a trend in which through empire and conquest, one group of people sets out to impose its institutional paradigm, its design pattern on the rest of the world to make the rest of the world look like itself. And the basic elements of the conquest and empire pattern is a aristocracy or a elite within a civilization developing. And that elite has a perspective that is different than the majority of the people within that civilization unit. And so there's an asymmetry that happens within society and the elite ends up adopting an extractive position in relation to the rest of the society and in relation to other societies. It, and by that, I mean, it tends to accumulate resources and power and influence for itself and agency for itself. And it correspondingly seeks to disenfranchise others. So that's the basic paradigm of this uh, empire. So it seeks growth for its own benefit. Uh, but it may not see itself that way. It may form some type of ideology in which it sees itself as doing something that's necessary or good. But if you just look at the, the facts of the pattern, it's an extractive model. So this extractive model has existed in different formats through the different civilization patterns that have developed since 
500 BC. And in the modern expression, we had in the 1800s and 1700s, we had the, the British Empire. And we had that ruled by an aristocratic elite and a financial elite. And in the course of the 1800s, moving into the 1900s, and in the course of World War One and World War Two, gradually the balance of power and the projection of power globally shifted from the group centered in England to the group centered on the East Coast. So this is the East Coast establishment, Washington, D.C., New York City in particular. And we can track that motion of empire by considering the fact that the U.S. has a global network of military bases around the world. It is what's called, uh, the empire today is called the hegemon, referencing Marxist theory that's become popularized. But the hegemon is basically the group that projects power influence, but it does so in a soft power way. Mainly power is wielded through control of the global reserve currency, which is also something that the British empire did. But in... Uh, in the U.S., in modern context, this is called dollar diplomacy. So the U.S.'s currency is sort of uh, foisted upon the world, uh, and, and that system is insured by this network of military bases. And so the U.S. is able to set a balance of trade policy, or I should say not the U.S. as a whole, but this elite group of ruling, this ruling class within the U.S., who is the centerpiece of this global empire, um, this is a group that is is maintaining this its extractive pattern of accumulating wealth and resources from the world and centralizing it within itself for its own benefit. Um, so this basic model is how we can understand uh, the hows and whys of the existence of the U.S. national security state. The U.S. national security state ensures and protects this global empire. So there's a few elements of this global empire that I now want to break down and discuss a little bit further. Um, the... You, the, this empire that is centered in the U.S. and is really based around the U.S. projecting a certain paradigm of institutions. It, it builds institutions in a way around the world to mimic its own institutions. So this could be the spread of, you could think of democratic institutions or more specifically institutions to... to turn the rest of the world into a type of republic model, democratic republic model that the U.S. has, but also to export America's economic model, its form of capitalism across the world. And so it does this, uh, it maintains this system and projects its influence uh, through carrots and sticks. So on one hand, the successes of the American system are sought to be imitated by civilizations around the world and so they willingly make these changes. But at the same time, you also have, so that's the carrot part, but at the same time, you also have the stick, which is the fact that U.S. projects this military presence around the world. And that military presence, in a sense, ensures that no competitors to the system are able to come up. And at the same time, you also have uh, another hidden hand element, an unseen hand that is often referenced as the deep state that is within this military apparatus that is a destabilizing agent. So it's working around the world in a covert way to use various methods to destabilize any opposition to the system. So this is a system that can work through assassinations. It can work through uh, promoting different coups and destabilizing the political dynamics of various regions in different ways. It can also work through economic hitmen that work to bribe different leaders of the world to get them to participate in the system and to coerce in various ways. So that group, in a sense, sets up a destabilizing dynamic that the overt military then responds and reacts to. And this is an important dynamic because we're going to see this as, as being something that is going to be heavily informing the current situation that we're dealing with. This idea that you have a hidden destabilizing influence that is not discussed in the media. It's not part of the overt political dynamics of our country, but it is one of the main methods by which this global empire is projected. So there's really there's an interesting dynamic here in America in which the America runs this or this global financial empire is run out of America 
the majority of, of American, the vast majority of Americans don't participate in it. And the vast majority of Americans don't see them. Even, even the people, a lot of people enacting this system are, are ones that don't see themselves as doing this. They don't see, they've adopted an ideology where they see themselves as not doing this. That, that America doesn't, the majority of Americans don't know that they are actually living within this type of empire complex. So it's a relatively small elite group that is responsible for implementing and maintaining this system, but there's a vast bureaucracy, or you could say a technocracy that's involved in maintaining it. And the people who are working within that bureaucracy don't see themselves as doing what they're doing. And as someone who's lived a, a lot of years in and around the DC metropolitan area, it's, it's fascinating to see this, that there's this absolutely massive bureaucratic complex and the people who work in it are ones who are maintaining and perpetuating this system, this extractive global system, but they don't see themselves as doing that. They would be very uh, opposed to the system if they knew what it was actually doing, but the realities of it are not taught in school and they're not shown in the media for various reasons that should be obvious. So I just want to point out a couple more things. The, the, the global capitalist class that is responsible for maintaining, perpetuating the system is not one that is purely centered in America. It is transnational. So the system has become transnational. That uh, the global empire that the U.S. has is one in which the, the nation state, the United Nation State is gradually, it's self-sacrificed so that uh, this this next phase of human civilization can be set up, which is an explicitly global one, where there's global institutions that act all across the world uh, and that the nation states are subjugated to. And so the U.S. is the global empire that is responsible for creating this system. So the ruling elite uh, that's associated with the capitalist class uh, across the world participates in the system, but the heart of it is in the financial system of America and American corporations, and then the military industrial complex that is running the whole thing is also seated in America. So America is the global hegemon that's responsible for what we call Western civilization, but is really an extension of this global empire. And this global inside this global empire that's ground this so this global capitalist empire that's grounded in america has a strong perspective on wanting to maintain the security that keeps itself in power and in charge so again the goal is to build a global institutional system out of this american-led model and so the perspective on global security that the u.s's network of military bases uh, projects is one that is intended to maintain the stability of this system. And the main actors responsible for this are the CIA, the State Department, Pentagon senior officials, uh, and then you have a network of think tanks in Washington and of, secure, of uh, corporate contractors that work with the military and with the government. And you have uh, sort of elite groups of capitalists, such as the New York Council on Foreign Relations, the World Economic Forum, and groups like that. Um, and then crucially, you also have the Federal Reserve System and its interconnection with the central banks of the various Western bloc countries, the capitalist core uh, of Western Europe and of other uh, countries, and that really serves as the heart of the global capitalist class. But again, it's rooted out of the New York Fed, and that is the heartland of uh, the dollar, which is the reserve currency. Now, as we discussed, the system that has been set up that's grounded in American capitalism and the American national security state is an extractive system. And its perpetuation depends on depends on making sure that no alternatives arise in any other regions of the world that challenges its hegemony. So that's, like we said before, that's where the destabilization aspect of the deep state comes out. And that's where American uh, foreign policy is set up, where we see 
America adopt a antagonistic relationship to many parts of the world, parts of the world such as Russia and China that it sees as a threat should those powers rise to assume any kind of influence in the world such that they may challenge the dominance of this U.S.-based system. So this relationship between the U.S. and its need to assume a particular type of relationship dynamic to the rest of the world and the reality that there are nations who are seeking their own growth and to grow and expand their own influence in the world, it cre- this is, creates the dynamics of geopolitics. And here I want to reference... An article by F. William Ingdahl from 2018. So this article is titled Behind the Anglo-American War on Russia. And this is going to give us some context for what America, this American governing elite, what its perspective is towards the world. And we're going to look at uh, coming up here some of the historical background of how this elite was or how this worldview was ported over from the British Empire in terms of a centralized group looking out at the rest of the world and figuring out how it can maintain its dominance in relation to other potential alliances that could form, that could challenge its dominance. Um, so this is going to be a quote that F. William Ingdahl cites in this article from the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Europe and Eurasia, a guy named Wes Mitchell. So now quoting the article, in his opening remarks to the Senate committee, Uh, Mitchell stated, quote, the starting point of the national security strategy of America is the recognition that America has entered a period of big power competition and that past U.S. policies have neither sufficiently grasped the scope of this emerging trend nor adequately equipped our nation to succeed in it. Then he continues with the following extraordinary admission. Contrary to the hopeful assumptions of previous administrations, Russia and China are serious competitors that are building up the material and ideological wherewithal to contest U.S. primacy and leadership in the 21st century. It continues to be among the foremost national security interests of the United States to prevent the domination of the Eurasian landmass by hostile powers. The central aim of the administration's foreign policy is to prepare our nation to confront this challenge by systematically strengthening the military, economic, and political fundamentals of American power. So by implication, the U.S. control of of Eurasia means the control of Russia, China, and the various other nations therein, meaning that the U.S. needs to find some way to manifest its influence in those regions. And so this is setting up the basic geopolitical situation that we're in. The... The quote there that expresses the U.S.'s general point of view in relation to China and Russia is that uh, it sees both nations as moving to build their own economic infrastructure independent of NATO control. And NATO being the security cooperation where the U.S. national security state can project its influence and entangle the various national security apparatuses of its close allies in Western Europe. So it brings them all basically under the wings of the American state and the American interests. So America innately has this position of looking at other sovereign states, such as China and Russia, as being hostiles because they may seek to project an influence in the region that is independent of the American elites designs. Now, from the point of view of the American ruling elite or the capitalist class that's ruling out of the American national security state, uh, and this is before America, this was also the perspective of the British when they were running the British Empire. But looking out into the world, their major threat, the thing that they most sought to prevent and control from happening the great power dynamic that could arise to challenge their supremacy uh, was a German alliance with Russia. So from perspective of these great Western powers, a German alliance with Russia was to be avoided at all costs. So the alliance of German technology and capital with Russian natural and human resources, that potent mix 
could create a empire that is capable of dominating the world and projecting its influence into the world in a manner that could compete or overcome the American system or before that the British system. So that perspective if we if we keep in mind that that simple strategy of geopolitics has been adopted by the British Empire and the American Empire from the beginning that explains the perspective of the foreign policy elite within America or within Britain stretching back to the First World War and the Second World War. In both of those wars, Germany and Russia were pitted against each other. Now, in my docuseries, The Deep State, I I present some material by Anthony Sutton, uh, who's a researcher from the 70s and 80s, uh, who makes a very convincing case that the American governing elite centered around uh, certain financial interests and certain mem- certain element of the national security state. Uh, this is a group that we might reference as the deep state, which are the destabilizing agents in the world that they kind of s- set up a dynamic in which Germany and Russia would challenge each other during those during those two world wars. And then it's more obvious after the Second World War, in the Cold War situation, almost the inverse of that happened, where in, uh, in the earlier wars, the U.S. partnered with Russia to fight against Germany, and in the Cold War, the uh, Americans partnered with Germany to go against Russia, or at least Western Germany. Uh, and, and in so doing, we're able to build out NATO and the overall number of treaties and security alliances that would form NATO and would end up resulting in the EU, the formation of the EU. Um, So in his article, Ingdahl writes that Washington created NATO in 1949 to weld Western Europe firmly to the future foreign policies of Washington, however destructive that might prove to the genuine interests of Germany, France, Italy, and other nations in Europe. And in order to do this, a situation was deliberately created where Russia is ostracized and from this community and made into a uh, a sort of pariah or a, an enemy for everybody to unite against. So this is a situation that, again, cr- prevents any type of deep alliance from forming between Germany and Russia in which they could recognize that they may have a mutual interest in aligning together to go against the global designs that this American empire has in store. And we can see the same policy in the Maastricht Treaty that came after the fall of the USSR, and that has to do with the reintegration of East and West Germany, again, to prevent Germany from rising up to any sort of power, have any kind of power and independence in the world, an independent perspective, it made uh, the condition of that reintegration come in which Germany sacrificed some of its sovereignty, key elements of its sovereignty, into this larger EU project. So it doesn't have its own central bank, it's wed instead to this larger European central bank, for example. So the economic autonomy of Germany was sacrificed uh, and subjugated into this larger trans-European entity. Uh, Again, preventing Germany from unilaterally forming any type of partnership with Russia. And then with the collapse of the USSR, that should have disbanded the reason for NATO's continued existence. But when we look at what developed after 1990, there was a number of destabilizations in Central Europe that were used as a rationale for continuing NATO as a, uh, as a security alignment between the Western European powers and America. So Europe was never given the chance or the opportunity to develop a sovereign uh, a sovereign uh, security force, an independent security force uh, from America. And instead it may remain tethered to NATO where American dom- where America dominates. Now meanwhile, during those post uh, post Cold War years, the you the financial wing of this ruling elite, uh, the economic hitman as John Perkins, calls them, uh, they went into Russia in order to privatize all the core Russian industries and to economically destabilize Russia. So they performed a type of economic war on Russia after the, after the collapse of the Soviet Union in order to make sure that Russia was sort of depleted 
and the Russian people sort of depleted in order that they to in order to ensure that they wouldn't rise to project any type of influence uh, in the region and also to prevent them from being a viable candidate for the EU to form a partnership with. Um, so Ingdahl writes that the Bush and Clinton administrations during the 1990s used Boris Yeltsin, who he claims was a CIA asset, essentially, to open up the fabulously resource-rich but money-poor Russian Federation after 1989. And so you had a sort of pro-Western governing uh, class installed in Europe, or in Russia that basically bankrupted the, comp- the country for a number of years. And that all those circumstances is what eventually led a coalition of oligarchs in Russia to band together um, to mm-hmm. promote Vladimir Putin as this new leader, to bring some stability to what was becoming a failed state. Now, this brings us to an important point that's very relevant to this today's current situation. Um, and that is that as part of the end of the Cold War, the U.S. promised Russia during high level talks between Moscow and Washington that the Americans would not expand NATO eastward in order to install military bases and missile systems uh, in countries like Ukraine and other Central European countries. Um, So that was sort of one of the compromises that came about as part of the ending of the Cold War. So the U.S. promised that they wouldn't do that in around 1990. However, U.S. and NATO broke that promise in a systematic way. And... In 1999, for example, Hungary, Poland, and the Czech Republic were officially invited to join NATO. And then by 2004, Washington further broke that promise by bringing in Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia. Then in 2007, Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense in the Bush years, announced that the Pentagon would install ballistic missile systems in Poland and the Czech Republic aimed at Russia. So this antagonization of Russia became a continual part of the U.S. national security policy after the fall of the Cold War. And so you have this internal aggressive action by these economic and financial parties that came into Russia to internally destabilize it and to privatize its key industries and basically weaken it from within And then you have this continuous Eastern motion of NATO. And so you have this internal and external antagonizing of Russia basically taking place. So this is the basic dynamic here. We have the Western powers uh, led by the U.S. deliberately and systematically antagonizing the Russians, refusing to form treaties and alliances or doing so and then breaking the terms of those alliances so it seems like as if to deliberately res- re- provoke a response. And all the while, this whole course of action continues to separate Russia from Germany and the EU, which again is part of the great geopolitical strategy of the American empire, is to prevent at all costs an alliance forming between Germany slash the EU and Russia. So a destabilized and weakened Russia is part of that plan. And so we can understand the hostile nature of American policy towards Russia as being part of this strategy where you want to prevent at all costs the formation of any possible competitor to this American system. Now, around the year 2000, we get a very clear picture of the neocon slash neoliberal strategy of American empire uh, going into the 21st century. So this is a famous project for the new American century, which was set up by a think tank or written out by a think tank right before the Bush years and the war on terror in which many of these policies, if not all these policies were systematically implemented across the world. So some of the main components of the project that the project of the new American century outlines is to preserve Pax Americana, which is the American empire, and a unipolar 21st century, meaning an American-dominated global system, through securing and expanding 
zones of, quote, zones of democratic peace to deter rise of a new great power competitor and to defend key regions such as Europe, East Asia, and the Middle East and exploit the transformation of war. By that, it means like the new methods of war that are not great militaries going against each other, but more to focus on covert operations, cyber weaponry, and things like that. There, this document writes that the U.S. should seek to establish a network of deployment bases or forward operating bases to increase the reach of current and future forces. It must move beyond Western Europe and Northeast Asia to increase permanent military presence in Southeast Asia and in East Asia to cope with the rise of China to a great power status. It should also deploy global missile defense to provide a secure basis for U.S. power projection around the world. The U.S. should seek to control space and cyberspace. Uh, and to create a new military service, the U.S. Space Force, with the mission of space control. It should exploit the Pentagon's revolution in military affairs, which includes moving to high-tech and unmanned weaponry, such as drones. It also should develop a new family of more effective nuclear weapons. It should redirect the U.S. Air Force toward a global first strike force. And it should end the Clinton administration's devotion to the anti-ballistic missile treaty with Russia. So again, all of this is set up in place to preserve this global financial uh, military industrial complex empire that is rooted out of America. And part of that strategy is to ensure that no other major bloc rises to challenge it. And another aspect is to covertly deploy this deep state uh, concept, this deep state enterprise to destabilize any potential threats that could arise. Now, a big aspect of what this deep state does in order to prevent any potential elements to arise to challenge this U.S. hegemony is to implement regime change in a covert way. So this is a way of getting the same ends that you would get out of a war, but you do so through targeted means. And a key instrument of this regime change initiative was to leverage NGOs or non-governmental organizations to weaponize them. So these would be used covertly to create pro-Washington regimes in strategic parts of the world. And this whole program really began, well, we saw it in the Middle East throughout the 20th century as part of the politics, the geopolitics of the oil trade. Uh, and we also saw it in Central and South America um, throughout the the, 20, the latter part of the 20th century. And this is something that John Perkins talks a lot about in my Deep State documentary. And, and the post-Soviet Union years, and the, uh, from, 1999 on, from 1990 onwards, we see this destabilization through NGOs uh, take place particularly in in the former satellite regions of the Soviet Union which had become independent nations so in this in, in the in the fashion of this global American empire where it says one thing but does another or it sees itself as this progressive democratizing force but in reality is is installing puppet regimes all over the world in these key areas the call and cry of democratic freedom would be the banner, but the reality would be the installation of puppet states that are highly tyrannical and uh, the use of disaster capitalism to private, install free, quote unquote, free markets, but which would actually uh, be controlled by Wall Street and European international banks and multinational corporations who would loot the resources of those countries for their own benefit but also to ensure that those resources could, wouldn't be privatized in, in the formation of a state that could rise to challenge American primacy. So it's like uh, the best defense is a good offense to prevent the rise of any sort of stability in any part region of the world, the U.S., offensively acts as a destabilizing force before so to prevent that from even happening so this the privatization scheme that we see all over the world is a type of almost military action it's preemptive action in order to you know the the this destabilization economically of these countries and the, and the improvertization of the world so ensures that the global capitalist system and the american national security state re remains in control.
and that their model will be the one that becomes the model that eventually would be globalized into the global governance uh, system that's being put in place and has been has systematically been put in place over the last hundred years but which it seems that we're nearing the end game of it being established so again the rallying call was the introduction of u.s style democracy freedom human rights and a neoliberal free market and the reality was uh the pu that we have puppet regimes all over the world um, but particularly in this case, across the former communist countries of Eastern Europe, Ukraine, and the newly formed Russian Federation itself. So these Washington regime change operations in this newest phase, uh, after the year 2000, uh, came to be called color revolutions. And each of these, uh, think of like the Arab Spring, but in, in Central Europe and uh, Eastern Europe, you see the same kind of dynamic where... Each country that has one of these revolutions happen, a democratic revolutions is given a color, a color scheme, something right out of like a public relations campaign. And uh, in Georgia, the state of Georgia, there was the Rose Revolution. In Iran, you saw the Green Revolution. And in 2004, in Ukraine, you saw the Orange Revolution. And Engdahl writes, in truth, what those Washington color revolution regime change interventions actually represented was an attempt to replace former communist leaders with hand-picked Washington corrupted po political leaders who would be willing to sell their national crown jewels and their people to select Western financial predators, such as George Soros. These strange strategies, of course, were implemented in South and Central America throughout the 70s and 80s and in the Middle East, like we said. So the mechanisms of impl impl implementation of this modern version is through these NGOs, these so-called human rights groups, uh, which are financed by this American ruling class. So it's like a hidden aspect of this uh, American empire. And the big one is the National Endowment for Democracy, which is essentially like a CIA branch. Uh, these were to become pri Washington's primary weapon for regime change. And then the big tech companies were also leveraged in this scheme. Uh, think, think of the Arab Spring. So the idea is that you tactically maneuver a, situ a political situation within a country in order to destabilize it and to, uh, at the same time, you're, you're financing and funding covertly the opposition parties and you're creating a situation in which any country who wants to use its own resources to develop itself uh, you are trying to overthrow those leaders and instead or all around the world basically install puppet regimes of people who are willing to sell themselves into this global capitalist system that has America as its, as its heartland. And it's an extractive system. But like we said, it's a this destabilizing technique is like a preventative measure the fact that you prevent the world from developing as it should means that you never have the opportunity for another rival power to arise to compete with america so again when i'm talking about america i'm not talking about the nation state as a whole or the idea that the majority of americans are actively participating and pursuing these policies the reality is it's a small elite group or a small governing class that is part military, part financial, part corporate. And that is the group that is running this global extractive system. Now, my feeling is that at the heart of this, there is an element of this, uh, this structure that is hidden from the rest of it. And that's the aspect that has to do with the, uh, the topic that I overview in my docu-series called the secret space program and this is has to do with uh investigating a, a completely different paradigm of physics and scientific research one that is in alignment with the old teachings of alchemy and the idea of the ether uh, and i would like to go more into that but that'll have to be a topic for another discussion because i want to get back and focusing on this current ukrainian situation but uh we have to remember that only a few years ago, there was this big revelation within the U.S. Navy and military that the existence of UFOs was real. And for me, that's proof of concept that behind the Navy and unaware of to the Navy, there is an element of the 
American national security state that is so classified and so hidden. It's like a mega Manhattan project. Only very few people know about it. And the ones who, the vast majority of people who participate in, in it aren't even aware of what they're doing because of the way that compartmentalization works and the way things are classified. So everybody is only seeing a little piece of it. But uh, that inner core to the national security state is protecting this new paradigm of technology and research. So the majority of the national security state is not aware of the worldview and ideas, the breakthrough ideas that have been produced by this inner core. And instead they're stuck in this scientific materialism and they've built out a worldview that is Malthusian and based on ideas of Darwin and eugenics. Overall, I think the system has been set up uh, and protected by this core, this uh, secret space program, quote unquote, in order to uh, build out the global civilization without the people who are building it out knowing what they're doing. And it's very clear that this whole extractive oligarchy is you know, super corrupt and operating according to a philosophy, philosophy of life that is highly destructive and outside of the, the cosmic laws and that this is destined to fall apart. But if that structure falls apart, the contours of global civilization will have been set up, in which case, in my opinion, this secret sp space program or this inner core to the national security state that's utilizing this either physics can come in and uh, and take this infrastructure that's been built out, can sacrifice uh, this whole you know Davos World Economic Forum, you know Bilderberg, all that stuff, that whole network of military finance corporations, that that whole system can be sacrificed once the formal structures of of international global civilization have been set up which they basically have at this point and i think that the timing of this great move this quote-unquote great reset initiative happening at this point where the basic contours of global civilization have been set up i don't think it's an accident that at this very moment we see this thing that nobody knows what to do with which is the fact that the military and the navy are talking about ufos and the existence of ufos being real but not having an explanation for it I think the explanation for it is that there is this inner core that the rest of it doesn't know about the, the, the you know, finance and the overt military and, you know, the overt corporations don't know about this inner secret core, this Manhattan Project. And so I think it's very possible that we could see the collapse of this whole corporate order based out of America and be replaced by something that's coming out of this inner core but that's just speculation i don't know for sure but i i do think that the great unknown factor in global geopolitics is this hidden hand which is beneath the deep state it's behind the deep state it's this inner core that is operating according to a completely different paradigm of thinking a completely different worldview and a different means of science and physics than the rest of society. So this is the breakaway civilization group that Richard Dolan talks about. This is the secret space program of Catherine Austin Fitz. This is the, you know, in esoteric philosophy, this would be the alchemists and the, in, and the interface with the invisible government. So, which is what we talked about in my previous video. So this is a great unknown factor. And uh, so that's just something to keep in mind. But let's now re return to Ukraine because everything I've been talking about just now in terms of the basic model of the global financial capitalist class and the military industrial complex that, that protects that system, that all this is playing into and informing what's happening in Ukraine. So we're going to be going to now into the specifics of this Ukrainian situation. And but we're going to be leveraging all the concepts and ideas that we've just been building out so far. So our investigation begins here with the 2004 Orange Revolution that took place in Ukraine. That's really going to set the backdrop for understanding what's happening today. So, so here I'm going to reference an article from Off Guardian by Johan Adibo. And uh, so he writes in this article, Ukraine has been targeted by the West for regime change since at least the Orange Revolution of 2004 which was a creation of the NGO 
branch of Western intelligence and involved the ousting of pro-Russian President Viktor Yanukovych. So we've already discussed regime change as a classic strategy of U.S. foreign policy. And then we have the color revolutions that we talked about. This one was the orange revolution. And we have also the use of NGOs and pro-democracy, quote unquote, initiatives by these NGOs in foreign countries and the utilization of these NGOs as weapons of U.S. foreign policy. So the government that came in after this orange revolution to oust the pro-Russian president, and by pro-Russian, it really means not privatizing the industry to Western financial corporations. It means basically trying to optimize your internal economy and, and sort of strengthening your, your nation, which is against U.S. foreign policy for that to happen. And that's the case all over the world, as we've just discussed. So what happened with the succeeding government that came in, I want to mispronounce this, the Timoshenko government, is that they private, in classic fashion, they privatized the state assets and they followed the basic dictates of U.S. foreign policy policy. Uh, by the U.S. interests that put them into power, which was to get them to support NATO membership to, quote, protect Ukraine from Russian aggression. So the ousted president became the opposition leader going against this, this party that was installed. And then in 2010, he was again elected to presidency. And again, he resumed his policies of building up economic relationships with Russia and using that money to develop the country. And then we have a second coup in 2014. Uh, Again, a U.S.-backed coup. And the purpose of this coup, once again, was to separate Ukraine and Russia, essentially, and to absorb Ukraine back into the EU and render it a NATO asset and reduce its utility as a Russian market. So Yanukovych in late 2013 and early 2014 was making big moves in terms of integrating with Russia economically and uh, politically. Then the, that's when the coup took place. And an armed insurgency was instigated and supported by the Western powers, the American-backed Western powers. Now, after this coup took place, that explains the Crimea situation, if you remember back in 2014, when Russia secured its assets in Crimea, which is a port and uh, a very important strategic port for Russia. Now, this coup ushered in an eight year long war from 2014 up to present day in the eastern region of Ukraine. Uh, between the, the, the pro-Western government that was installed after the coup and uh, successionist groups in this eastern region who wanted to keep close ties with Russia. So uh, on this topic of this 2014 coup, we're going to spend some more time with this. Uh, William Ingdahl now, we're going to be referencing some of his writings. He writes that the Washington orchestrated coup in Ukraine, the coup d'etat in Ukraine in February 2014, was explicitly aimed at driving a bloody and deep wedge between Russia and Germany. At the time, Ukraine was the energy pipeline link feeding the German industry with Russian gas. German exports of everything from machine tools to cars to high-speed locomotives to build the rapidly recovering Russian economy was transforming the geopolitical balance of power in favor of an emerging German-Russian-centered Eurasia to the detriment of Washington. So earlier in this episode, we talked about the power, pol- the great power politics in Eurasia and U.S.'s strategy of pre- pre- preventing an economic alliance and political alliance between Russia and Germany at all costs and how this had been a major factor underlying U.S. actions throughout the 20th century. Um, so again, this is a factor here. Now, if we consider the situation in eastern Ukraine, that eight-year-long war that's been taking place, uh, on that topic, Ingdahl writes that a predominantly orthodox ethnic Russian population in eastern Ukraine declared succession. And western Ukraine, which is predominantly Roman Catholic, 
declared a de facto war in this region, in these uh, eastern regions against Russia. And so these two regions are these two regions are Donetsk and Lugansk. So both had voted for independence from Ukraine in 2014 after the coup. And the new Ukrainian government launched a war against the provinces to crush their bid for independence. And this war has up to date cost for over 14,000 lives. So if you've been paying attention to this current conflict, you've, you, you've heard the Russian uh, actors and Putin talking about denazifying Ukraine. And what he means by that is that this war between the successionists is, thought, is fought via these armed groups that are related to white nationalists and neo-Nazi factors, that, that, the, that these extremist groups are the ones who are fighting this war in the East on behalf of the Ukrainian government. And it's likely the U.S. intelligence agencies who's organized this whole situation in classic fashion, just like they did in the Middle East with Al-Qaeda and ISIS and the Muslim Brotherhood. Those are all creations of the deep state to destabilize regions, which is part of the foreign policy of this U.S. national security establishment. I have one more article that I want to go over about the 2014 situation that is informing what's happening today. And this one is from the website fair.org and is by Bryce Green. And again, all these articles I'll be referencing at the uh, in the written description so you can find them. Um, so in this article, he writes, The backdrop of the 2014 coup and annexation cannot be understood without looking at the U.S. strategy to open Ukrainian markets to foreign investors and give control of its economy to giant multinational corporations. Again, this is a part of the U.S. foreign uh, foreign strategy, foreign policy strategy that we've talked about, this idea of privatizing and redirecting the development, economic development of countries throughout the world in a, in a way that benefits U.S. corporations and is extractive and gets them dependent on Washington and this national security state and the financial branch of it, the, uh, the sort of Wall Street oligarchy. Um, he writes, a key tool for this has been the International Monetary Fund, which leverages aid loans to push governments to adopt policies friendly to foreign investors. The IMF is funded by and represents Western financial capital and governments and has been at the forefront of efforts to reshape economies around the world for decades, often with disastrous results. And again, this is a playbook that we've seen all over the world and uh, a, a great person, a great reference for how this whole thing has worked is uh, from John Perkins, who was somebody who worked in that system for a number of years and became sort of like a whistleblower for it. And they continue with the article. He writes, In Ukraine, the IMF had long planned to implement a series of economic reforms to make the country more attractive to investors. These included cutting wage controls, i.e. lowering wages, reforming and reducing health and education sectors, which make up the bulk of employment in Ukraine, and cutting natural gas subsidies to Ukrainian citizens that made energy affordable to the general public. So th th these are all the policies of the pro-Western government that was installed but the, the so-called pro-Russian government was the one that wanted to keep these, these populist policies in place. So in 2013, after early steps to integrate with the West, this is before the 2014 coup, the so-called pro-Russian Ukrainian president Viktor Yanukovych turned against these changes and ended trade integration talks with the EU. Months before his overthrow, he restarted economic negotiations with Russia and a major snub to the Western economic sphere. So then that's when the, the coup happened. And then after the 2014 coup, the new government quickly restarted the EU deal. After cutting heating subsidies in half, it secured a $27 billion commitment from the IMF. The IMF's goals still include reducing the role of the state invested interests in the economy in order to attract more foreign capital. So classic U.S. foreign policy economic warfare. Destabilize the country politically and economically. That's the West. That's in the this empire, Western empire's interests. And then continuing with this article, he writes, The U.S. was fueling anti-government sentiment through mechanisms like U.S. aid and the National Endowment for Democracy, both of which we've already discussed, just as they had done in 2004. 
In December 2013, Victoria Newland, the Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs and a longtime regime change advocate, said that the U.S. government has spent $5 billion promoting democracy, quote unquote, in Ukraine since 1991. The money went towards supporting senior officials in the Ukraine government, members of the business community, as well as opposition civil society who agree with U.S. goals. And then just to give some more context to the National Endowment for Democracy, which is this basically CIA thing. In 1991, the Washington Post's writer David Ignatius wrote that the organization functions by, quote, doing in public what the CIA used to do in private. Meaning that the NED targets governments who oppose U.S. military economic policy and stirs up anti-government opposition in order to destabilize and overthrow those governments. Uh, and in 2013, the NED, the National Endowment for Democracy, the pre their president wrote a piece in the Washington Post that described Ukraine as, quote, the biggest prize in the East-West rivalry between Russia and the American Axis. So the Washington-backed opposition that toppled the government in 2014 was fueled by far-right and openly Nazi elements like the right sector, quote, uh, the right sector, which is what they're called, capitalized right sector. One far-right group that grew out of the protests was the Azov Battalion, a paramilitary militia of neo-Nazi extremists. Their leaders made up the vanguard of the anti-Yanukovych anti protests and even spoke at opposition events in the Maiden, along, which is a, a big court, uh, big open area in the capital, alongside U.S. regime change advocates like McCain and Newland. After the violent coup, these groups were later incorporated into the Ukrainian Armed Forces, the same armed forces that the U.S. had now given $2.5 billion. So there was an infamous incident in this coup where CIA-backed snipers in Kiev ignited a riot and panic, and that was the critical event that caused the democratically elected President Viktor Yanukovych to flee for his life. And then the next day, the Obama administration, led by the State Department and Victoria Newland and the U.S. ambassador and legions of CIA operatives inside the uh, Ukrainian situation, they openly installed their hand-picked puppets using overt neo-Nazis uh, to do so. So now getting into the details of this current situation, I'm going to reference back an article I cited earlier, which is by Bryce Green, and it's titled, What You Should Know About the Ukraine Coup. Um, so this one sets the stage by talking about in recent times, and actually part of its overall strategy, but especially acutely in recent times, the U.S. has been in intentionally provoking Russia, it seems. And my overall thesis here is that Russia was basically drawn into the situation by the U.S. and the NATO bloc and this sort of deep state entity behind, working behind the scenes is creating a situation that is repeatedly crossing the line in the sand that Russia has stated that it can no longer tolerate if certain uh, things are done. And the U.S. and the U.S.-backed elements in Western U in the uh, Ukrainian government are continuously violating those standards, almost as if to intentionally draw Russia into this conflict. Um, so to say that is not to say I support Russia doing what they're doing or I support war in Ukraine or anything like that. I, you know, my own personal opinion, I feel like is irrelevant. I'm just trying to give you an analysis about what I think are the factors that are driving the conflict and what the set of possibilities are in terms of the larger uh, end game might be here for the Western powers who I do think are instigating this. So I'm going to be sharing what I think is the Russian perspective here uh, and that, I think, is going to help us understand how and why they made the moves that they did. And then I'm going to be discussing what I think the potential behind-the-scenes motivations for the Western perspective is of this elite group in terms of what their intentions are about why they would intentionally provoke Russia into doing this. So I think Ukraine is being used as an arena within which this... Uh, this sort of greater game is being played. And the, and the, unfortunately, the Ukrainian people are being used as sort of pawns in this game. So much like the people of the Middle East have been used as pawns in, the, in a greater geopolitical game for, for, you know, decades, if not 100 plus years. So 
Uh, in this article, Bryce Green says uh, that Putin has been clear in recent times about a path to de-escalation in this region and has been basically seeking not to not to do what he's doing. Uh, he's been seeking uh, through treaties a way to bring stability to the situation despite the coup of 2014 and despite this uh, type of civil war situation that's been t- that, t- uh, that is taking place in the eastern region of the country in terms of these two separatist regions. So his, his main demand has been for direct negotiations to end the expansion of the hostile military alliance that's taking place on his borders. And this is just a continuation of Russian interests going back to the end of the Cold War that they at that early time that specified that they that NATO can't expand east as part of the treaty uh, for u- uniting Germany and uh, for breaking down the Soviet Union. He, Putin announced that, quote, we have made it clear that NATO's move to the east is unacceptable and that the United States is standing with missiles on our doorstep. Putin asked, how would the Americans react if missiles were placed at the border with Canada or Mexico? Um, and then the author notes that in corporate media coverage, no one bothers to ask this important question. Instead, the assumption is that Putin ought to tolerate a hostile military alliance directly across its border. The U.S., it seems, is the only country allowed to have a sphere of influence. So an example of this type of media coverage that you get in the West that that whitewashes this whole scenario and the U.S.'s involvement and NATO's involvement in this situation. The New York Times on January 26th of this year asked, quote, can the West stop Russia from invading Ukraine? But shrugs at the U.S. dismissal of Putin's terms as non-starters. The Washington Post in December of 2021 reported, Some analysts have expressed worry that the Russian leader is making demands that he knows Washington will reject, possibly as a pretext for military action once he is spurned. The Post quoted one analyst, I don't see us giving them anything that would suffice relative to their demands. And what troubles me is that they know that. All of this missing context allows war hawks to promote disastrous escalations of tensions. The Wall Street Journal on December 22nd, 2021, published an opinion piece trying to convince readers that there was a, quote, strategic advantage to risking war in Ukraine. And uh, the piece was authored by a U.S. Army War College uh, professor, summarized the familiar hawkish talking points and claimed that a neutral Ukraine is anathema to Western values of national self-determination and sovereignty. So the great irony is there. There is that the U.S. had undermined that by orchestrating these secrets of coups. So I just want to point out overall, this is something I mentioned earlier. Mentioned earlier that there's a big gulf between how the American bureaucracy and the overt American state and the citizens how they see themselves and they see America's role in the world, and how the people who are on the periphery of that system, such as those in Central and South America and those in the Middle East and those in Asia and in Eastern Europe, how they see this American system, because they get to see the expansionist extractive aspect of it. There's a big difference between how we see ourselves and what the reality of the situation is. Now, moving to the Corbett report, which is a, uh, a source I like a lot. He writes in a Substack post, James Corbett, that the final straws prompting this recent military assault appear to have been, uh, he gives three points. Number one, an increase in NATO threats and provocations in recent months, including joint NATO-Ukrainian ger- drills and an unprecedented $200 million airlift of weapons and ammunition to Kiev in January. Um, The second point, the U.S. slash NATO rejection of Russia's demands for a guarantee that NATO would not offer membership to Ukraine. And number three, an increase in fighting in the Donbass, which is that eastern, that region between Ukrainian troops and Russian-backed separatists, leading the latter, the separatists, to ask Russia for military support. Now, this is the region where there's 14,000 that's been killed since 2014. So... Russia has been very clear about the terms that and, and, and very willing to set treaties with certain terms about 
what it could do to prevent this war from happening. And there's been a flat refusal to negotiate on any of them by this by the, the Western powers, the NATO-backed powers, which is really the American elite. So the fact that they are refusing to negotiate any terms uh, in terms of respecting Russia's security needs in the region implies that they are deliberately provoking this war with Russia, this proxy war within Ukraine with Russia. And what I'm going to be getting at later is the fact that it seems that what's desired here is the number of consequences that are going to result. And I don't think the consequences are World War III, but I think the consequences are this, these economic sanctions and the cascading uh, series of economic effects and political effects that will take place as a result of this conflict. And we're already seeing that start to play out today. <clears throat> so to get back to some of the events immediately preceding this current invasion, from Sputnik News, um, which is a source that I find interesting because it represents Russia's point of view. And there's a, there's a value in that. So if you only use Western sources, you're only going to get this Western elite point of view. So we need both. And we need to be able to uh, synthesize information using a variety of sources. So from Sputnik News... Um, they write, in mid-December, Russia handed over its draft security proposals to the U.S. and to NATO to ensure European security and stability, meaning to prevent this situation. On the 26th of January, Russia received written responses to its proposals from Washington and the alliance. Both the U.S. and NATO disregarded Moscow's core demands about the alliance's non-expansion, Ukraine's non-admission to the bloc, non-deployment of offensive weapon systems near Russia's borders, and the return of the bloc's European capabilities and infrastructure. So, again, it seems like the flat-out rejection of all negotiations with Russia and to just continually to do whatever they want to do in terms of um, militarizing Ukraine against Russia this coming after they already deliberately interfered with Ukrainian sovereign democratic politics in order to in instill those two coups, you know, this is something that is deliberately provoking Russia into doing this action. So I'm going to try to continue to try to build what the actual Russian perspective is here and what they see themselves as dealing with. This is uh, citing an article from Global Research is going to be going over some of the material that we just went over. Why Putin Took Action by Joe Loria. Uh, he writes, The Russian military action follows demands made in December by Russia to the U.S. and NATO in the form of treaty proposals that would require Ukraine and Georgia not to join NATO, U.S. missiles in Poland and Romania to be removed, and NATO deployments to Eastern Europe reversed. The U.S. and NATO rejected the proposals and instead sent more NATO forces to Eastern Europe and have been heavily arming Ukraine. So again, Ukraine's being used as a proxy here for this maneuver by the Western axis against uh, Russia. So now let's look at two direct uh, reports from Russia, one's from the Kremlin and one's from Putin. And now with everything we've talked about, we'll be able to make sense of what they're saying here. In March 2021, a new military, this is from the uh, Kremlin, a press release. In March 2021, a new military strategy was adopted in Ukraine. This document is almost entirely dedicated to confrontation with Russia and sets the goal of involving foreign states in a conflict with our country. The strategy stipulates the organization of what can be described as a terrorist underground movement in Russia's Crimea and in the Donbass region in the east. It also sets out the contours of a potential war which should end, according to the Kiev strategists, uh, who are really the kind of American-backed military sector, with the assistance of the international community on favorable terms for Ukraine, as well as, listen carefully please, with foreign military support in the geopolitical confrontation with the Russian Federation. In fact, this is nothing other than preparation for hostilities against our country, Russia. As we know, it has already been stated today that Ukraine intends to create its own nuclear weapons, and this is not just bragging. Ukraine has the nuclear technologies created back in the Soviet times and the delivery vehicles for such weapons. If Ukraine acquires weapons of mass destruction, the situation in the world and in Europe will drastically change, especially for us, for Russia. We cannot but react to this real danger, all the more so since, let me repeat, Ukraine's Western patrons may help it acquire these weapons to create yet another threat to our country. Since 2014, the United States alone has spent billions of dollars for this purpose, including supplies of arms and equipment and training of specialists. 
In the last few months, there has been a constant flow of Western weapons to Ukraine, ostentatiously with the entire world watching. Foreign advisors super supervise the activities of Ukraine's armed forces and special services, and we are well aware of this. Over the past few years, military contingents of NATO countries have been almost constantly present on Ukrainian territory under the pretext of exercises. The Ukrainian troop control system has already been integrated into NATO. This means that NATO headquarters can issue direct commands to the Ukrainian armed forces, even to their separate units and squads. The United States and NATO have started an imprudent development of Ukrainian territory as a theater of potential military operations. Their regular joint exercises are obviously anti-Russian. Last year alone, over 23,000 troops and more than 1,000 units of hardware were involved. A law has, al has already been adopted that allows foreign troops to come to Ukraine in 2022 to take part in multinational drills. Understandably, these are primarily NATO troops. This year, at least 10 of these joint drills are planned. Obviously, such undertakings are designed to be a cover-up for a rapid buildup of the NATO military group on Ukrainian territory. And then uh, in a statement from Putin, he writes, or he states, the military operation he was launching was a question of life or death for Russia, referring to NATO's expansion east since the late 1990s. He said, quote, for the United States and its allies, it is a policy of containing Russia with obvious geopolitical dividends. For our country, it is a matter of life and death, a matter of our historical future as a nation. This is not an exaggeration. This is a fact. It is not only a very real threat to our interests, but to the very existence of our state and to its sovereignty. It is the red line which we have spoken about on numerous occasions. They have crossed it. Putin said the existential threat from NATO's expansion was the main reason for military action. Our biggest concerns and worries are the fundamental threats which irresponsible Western politicians created for Russia consistently, rudely, and unceremoniously from year to year. I'm referring to the eastward expansion of NATO, which is moving its military infrastructure ever closer to the Russian border. Now, furthering with the sort of broader Russian perspective of what's going on and their how they see these activities taking place in Ukraine uh, in terms of NATO's growing relationship there and the American-driven backing of this uh, situation. Uh, there was a conference on in mid-February by a, a Russian-based think tank titled Geopolitical War of the West Against Russia, the Ukrainian Case. And during the event, political scientists, experts and journalists and public figures from Russia and a variety of other countries discuss possible developments around Ukraine. So this is right before the crisis broke out. And uh, so to kick things off, the director of the event emphasized that, uh, from their perspective, the massive information campaign against Russia in the U.S. and in the Western, uh, the Western bloc is an obvious evidence that the U.S. is interested in new war and is preparing for it. So this is what Russia sees. They see themselves as being not the aggressors, but rather they see themselves as being rather the, the, I wouldn't say the victims here, but the ones who are being acted upon by these Western imperialist forces. Also in this, in this uh, conference, the uh, organizer said that uh, from, a ge from a geopolitical point of view, Washington needs this war for several reasons and points out that this war will, ver will very seriously throw Russia away from Europe and create a huge number of problems in building Russian-European relations. If we remember back to this grand strategy of England slash America of ensuring that Ger a Germany-led EU never partners in a serious way with Russia, we can get an understanding of how and why this is important. And then they write, and again, this is right on the cusp of this invasion happening, and now about a week after it started, we can see all of this stuff having come true. Uh, listen to this. With every new piece of information about Russia's imminent attack on Ukrainian territory, there is a wave of news about the need for new sanctions, such as stopping Nord Stream 2, which has already happened, which is the gas pipeline, and the correctness of sending American troops and weapons to Europe. We understand why this is being done. Uh, they also point out that Washington needs some kind of common enemy. There was a moment when the U.S. lost this enemy, and that was replaced or that need was filled by first by international terrorism and Islamism. And now it's being made again from Russia. So Russia is playing a useful role here in the U S grand strategy. And that's something that's important to keep in mind. And a third factor that the, uh, the Russian point of view sees is, is that the, 
the U.S. elite find have a need to consolidate the NATO bloc, which has lost all meaning without a clear geopolitical opponent, which is the role that the USSR used to act in. So the policy of sanctions and pressure is also one of the elements of the geopolitical game of the U.S. with Russia. And then uh, a fourth factor is that the imposed sanctions and the whole uh, public perception and the ability to control the narrative around this invasion, it should greatly undermine the position of the Russian president and turn the elites against him and thereby accelerate what Western strategists want, which is the removal of the Russian president and most likely the the move to do what the what the uh, the Western elite does with everybody else, which is to, to privatize the Russian state, essentially, and to gut it as they were already doing during the 90s. So overall, the U.S. wants to deconstruct Russia as a power of influence in Eurasia. And basically, a, a, a Russia that has a strong national perspective has no right to exist at all. And so, you know, this is not just true with Russia. It seems to be true everywhere that a strong, healthy nation that has its own interests in mind rather than the U.S. oligarchy's interest is anathema and uh, a violation of U.S. foreign policy, it seems. So overall, the synthesizers view, they see that war in Ukraine would, would serve U.S. interests by weakening Russia. Such a war, however disastrous, would forge an even stronger anti-Russian consensus across Europe, refocus NATO against a, a main enemy, result in economic sanctions that would further weaken Russia's economy and would sap the strength and morale of Russia's military while undercutting Mr. Putin's domestic popularity. So this escalation of tension, this war in Ukraine is a win-win for Washington and Washington's interests. Um, but there are a number of cascading consequences of this in the larger geopolitical landscape, but also in the economy and the financial sphere and in the energy markets. And these are all things that have been put under increasing tension and pressure as a result of the global lockdowns over the past two years. So it seems that perhaps these cascading secondary consequences could feed into this Great Reset agenda that seems to be underlying a lot of the activities of the Western political and financial elite over the past couple years. So one of the main themes of this larger transition that's taking place, this Great Reset, is that one of the main pillars of American empire the american global dominance has been the dollar of as the reserve currency but the financial and economic system that the this dollar system this global trade in dollars that system is falling apart and, and very gradually and it has been you could really say see it take place during the 2007 2008 financial crisis and the fact that those system of never-ending bailouts took place you can kind of get a hint that that whole system is really not uh, autonomously run by bankers and greedy corporations, but rather is subsumed into this larger national security dynamic and this sort of global empire uh, framework that is taking place. So that whole system could not be allowed to fail until its replacement was put into effect. And it seems that the replacement is this global system of central bank digital currencies that the federal uh that the central banks of the world have been colluding to to develop and put into effect and it seems like that's the underlying driver behind the great reset and behind the global lockdowns and all that stuff is to gradually have a sort of disaster capitalism situation put in place where you have a deconstruction of the global economy where the real economy of goods and services and trade is sort of slowly wiped out due to the lockdowns uh, and other policies. And then you have this financial apparatus, have this last ditch effort to suck up all the resources and such as farmland and, uh, and to, to centralize things before you have this uh, deconstruction and demolition of the, of the financial system in one great motion take place for it only to be replaced by this system that, that's been developed in, on the side and, and just kind of waiting to be implemented, which is this digital currency crypto situation that's going to be run out of the central banks. So 
that's all been building up and the consequences of this war in terms of energy prices uh, skyrocketing and, and what the inevitable effects are in terms of uh, the overall global economy. There tends to be an inverse relationship between rise in energy prices and collapse in, uh, in GDP. And, you know, we have a, a system with, with as much fragility as our current system um, already coming off of this lockdown situation where it just, where, and, and we have inflation coming on top of that to have a major catastrophe in global energy markets could be something that really uh, it could, could be the final thing that that triggers a global financial uh, situation, a crisis. Furthermore, energy crisis would would uh, further exasperate the supply chain issues and the balance of trade issues that are taking place all, all over the world. So everything that was put in place over the latter half of the 20th century and the early 21st century seems to be gradually grinding to a halt over these past few years. And this is just something that further catalyzed that breakdown and it's just so amazing that you have this public campaign and this very obvious collusion in this initiative called the great reset with the world economic forum and it has these sort of agents all over the world and, and governments and, and in major corporations who are clearly attached to it who are uh who, who very obviously colluded during the lockdowns and with the whole pandemic situation and now these same people are in charge to deal with this next phase so it seems like this is clearly a initiative that's been in the works a plan that's been in the works for for some time and it's being enacted on on the sort of global chessboard right now so just just look to to take a quick look at some of the uh, the cascading consequences of this situation. I just want to touch on the energy and on the finance. So uh, energy wise, I'm going to cite an article from F. William Ingdahl. And actually, this is important when it talks about the U.S. consolidating its own uh, rulership over the um, or the U.S. elite consolidating its rulership over the, the global order that's going to emerge after this Great Reset, is that there has been a, a move to make Europe ever more dependent on U.S. military and economic influence at this critical point in time. So military-wise, this whole war in, with Russia leads the countries of the EU to further come into the NATO orbit, and of course the U.S. leads NATO. But then economically, what's interesting is that this energy crisis that's taking place is coming right on the heel of a major energy uh, situation taking place in Europe, and particularly in Germany, in which in the, in the years preceding this current moment in time, Germany had an, uh, adopted this, this policy of taking down all its coal and nuclear plants and under the under the idea that they were going to move into a green economy which they didn't do and the green economy is not reliable in a consistent way in terms of the way it produces energy so the the underlying support for that system as it was taking out its coal and nuclear capacity was to become ever more reliant on russian gas so a crisis now with Russia and, and with sanctions and all this stuff going back and forth is that the energy prices in Europe are skyrocketing. And that's a major destabilizing element politically for the country, but it also makes Europe more dependent on U the U.S. now to receive its energy supplies. And so there's this, there's this amazing move right now in which the U.S. is, ga is gaining prestige in, in its relationship with Europe uh, in this whole situation. So on this topic, I'm going to quote F. William Ingdahl. Uh, he writes in, the, in January of this year, quote, An astonishing transformation of the economies of the world's most advanced industrial economies is underway and gaining momentum. The heart of the transformation is energy, and the absurd demand for a zero-carbon energy economy by 2050 or before. So to eliminate carbon from the energy industry is not at this time or perhaps ever possible. Uh, but the push for a so-called green energy economy based on these renewable technologies, um, which he's right to be skeptical of, the push for this economy will mean tearing apart the world's most productive economies. Without a viable industrial base, NATO countries become a military joke. And those are really the non-American NATO countries. that makes them all more dependent on America for their energy policy. Uh, so it seems like the EU, the current EU 
energy crisis, which is being exasperated by this war, it seems as if it was pre-planned. Uh, so continuing with his article, he writes, On December 31st, of the of last year the new german coalition government shut down three of its remaining six nuclear power plants permanently and the remaining three plants must close by the end of 22 2022 according to this legislation at the same time the green energy agenda of the government since 2016 has closed 15.8 gigawatts of coal generation and they did so, this at a point where natural gas in their reserves was extremely low entering winter and when any severe cold front could lead to power blackouts. So because of this German refusal to allow the import of a second Russian gas pipeline, which is the Nord Stream 2, uh, so this pipeline was built, but it hasn't been certified or allowed to open, and now it's been basically canceled at this point. So because of this denial now of the import of Russian gas, even though the situation was basically designed to make them dependent on Russian gas up until this point, Germany is facing a 500% increase in the spot price of electricity compared to January of last year. To make up for the fact that solar and wind, despite glowing propaganda, do not fill the gap, Germany's electric grid, electric grid must import significant electricity from EU neighbors, France and the Czech Republic, and ironically, much of it from nuclear plants in those countries. So overall, every aspect of the current EU energy plan is designed to wreck their modern industrial economies. And the architects who generously fund the green think tanks know this. So to bring wind and solar, the only two serious options being implemented to replace coal, gas, and nuclear is simply said not possible. And so the timing of this is amazing. When you're talking about the Great Reset and, you're, and we're seeing right now the deconstruction of the economy, the industrial economy of Europe take, take place. So this is happening in real time. Now, let's, let's consider some other consequences here to the, the overall stability of the global economy and financial markets and the political situation in a variety of other countries. That These are the consequences of a volatile energy market and the rises in energy prices. So this, this one comes from RAIN, which is a U.S.-based think tank, also known as Stratford. They write that, quote, high energy prices will exacerbate global inflation rates by further driving up the cost of shipping, food production, electricity, and other industries that consume oil and gas. This could produce political ramifications across the globe as more people feel the pinch of higher prices and increased pressure on their governments to implement relief programs. In the high impact but low probability scenario in which Russia cuts off energy exports to Europe, rampant oil and gas inflation would follow as would likely widespread shortages in Europe. Given tight conditions in global oil and gas markets, markets, such a scenario would see oil and natural gas markets reach new heights, potentially as much as $120 to $150 per barrel of oil. Right now it's at $113 at the point I'm recording this. And energy prices could remain at those record levels for an extended period of time. And then to talk about the, the food inflation and commodity price uh, inflation that we just referenced, uh, here's another article called Exploding Inflation, Why Anti-Russian Sanctions Are a Self-Inflicted Disaster for the, e for the U.S. and EU. Uh, this is by Ekaterina Blanova. Uh, quote, the effect of these sanctions, which are mind-numbingly short-sighted, is that they will actually have a very detrimental effect on energy prices. And not only energy prices, but food prices as well, which will precipitate a profound economic crisis in Europe, which is already in a crisis. Uh, it will exacerbate inflationary pressures throughout Western economies. They will hurt not only Russia, they will also hurt the working people of Western Europe and the United States, and particularly small businesses and medium-sized businesses, which is the main economic engine and which is the main region that has been destroyed by these lockdowns and the recent policies the past few years. And then following up on, the, uh, for, on some further notes with the energy situation, this article states that Germany's decision to freeze the Nord Stream 2 project earlier this week is also a massive problem for Europe since European natural gas reserves are at record lows. Russian gas is crucial for heating European households and European industries. In particular, food supply and food production may suffer. Natural gas is one of the most important ingredients in producing artificial fertilizers, and so this will inevitably impact food prices. So I want to close with one other comment of something to keep your eye on, which is the removal of Russia via sanctions from the Western financial system. 
which would encourage Russia to implement their own internal financial processing systems. So the specific financial processing system that people are talking about is SWIFT, um, which is how credit is moved between banks, essentially. And, uh, or it's how the transactions are communicated between banks. And so Russia and China have already been developing their own internal ones. But overall, this process of, of rejecting Russia from the Western system could or probably will bring Russia in financial alignment with China. And at the same time that all this is going on, U.S.-China relationships are being strained. And it seems perhaps or it seems most likely this is deliberate and using Taiwan and drumming up uh, political tensions between Taiwan and the US and China is as a means of prompting this antagonistic relationship between the two but there's a number of, of features that are taking place between US and China uh and their foreign policy relationships that is contentious at this moment in time and I don't have a clear insight of what the end game is in terms of why it's desirable to push those two together or why it's desirable to antagonize us china relationship but that seems to be taking place at the same time so that's something to keep your eye on um so i'm going to conclude this here this this analysis and survey of perspectives on this current current situation that's going on i hope this was valuable to you Overall, we need to move beyond this idea that there's a good guy and a bad guy and instead develop a more nuanced perspective, perspective that allows us to understand what the strategic actions and reactions of these various parties, uh, what they lead to. Because I think that, that it's that way of thinking that will give you agency and empower you to make decisions for yourself and for your family uh, that will be beneficial. And if you just look at things in terms of the simplistic good guy, bad guy dichotomy, you're really just dealing with a kind of a fantasy. You're in somewhat, uh, you know, kept in like a childlike mind state. So this is a more mature way of analyzing the situation by looking at the harsh realities of both both sides and seeing, and, and particularly understanding that the Western bloc and particularly the American elite are not the good guys uh, in terms of their relationship with the world. So the, but, but the great unknown factor here is this, uh, the idea that there exists within and behind the deep state and the national security state and the financial elite that's unseen even to them. They, they don't even know that they're, they're uh, sort of shielding this inner entity. There is a program that's responsible for this, UFO situation and the technologies and the ideas behind it. And that's the great unknown factor is when and how will this inner inner entity reveal itself and what relationship will it express to the, to the larger world? So that's the great question. So more on this to come. Thank you again for tuning in. God bless. And I'll be back soon with some more analysis. Thank you.